welcome back to our four o'clock talk. It is my great pleasure now to introduce to you your next keynote speaker, Kane Naughton, who uh, is the managing director at Cohesive, or I'm sorry, at COSIV, and has previously been in the trenches as a sysadmin, government anti-spam enforcer, botnet fighter, bank threat intelligence manager, and penetration tester. So please give a warm welcome to your keynote speaker, Kane Naughton. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, I guess personally today's a very proud day for me. Uh, I'd like to thank Malcolm Turnbull for his trust in having me replace Alistair McGibbon as head of the ACSC. Uh, it was a big surprise for me, but you know, I think I'm the right person for the... Oh, sorry, yeah, it turns out it's just an Ausert thing. Don't worry about that. But when I do get the big job, I'll still remember all of you plebs. It'll be fine. So today, uh, I guess a little bit of a contentious topic, but. I'd like to talk to you all today why uh, incident response isn't really incident response in most of the contexts we do it. Now, this might be a little bit of a controversial view, but I hope you'll be with me by the end of it. So, uh, yes, my name's Kane Norton. Uh, I run a company. We do a lot of uh, defensive work, but I'm an offensive person at heart, so you'll have to excuse me if I accidentally swear during my presentation. Um, we talk to a lot of people about how they work, how their organisations work, and quite often I think we often hear the things from them that they won't say to their management, the sort of stuff you only hear after a couple of beers at something like OzCert. And uh, if you are a CSO in this room, hopefully you can sort of take something from this. Um, firstly, I just want to start with like why we're here. I don't mean like here in this room, I mean here in security. So. Back in the old, old days, networks were just open. Everyone just did whatever they wanted. It was fine. But eventually, some jerk wrote the first worm, and someone had to invent firewalls. So I've been fortunate over the years at OzCert to have uh, met most of the sort of potential uh, mothers and fathers of firewalls. Uh, most of them sort of don't have a lot of nice things to say that, about their ill-begotten progeny now because for a long time, firewalls were computer security. Uh, for a lot of people, they still are now. Um, back when they originally started, the idea was to keep people out. I think a lot of people were still use them that way. Um, funnily enough, at the time, AT&T had a bit of a different perspective. They wanted to keep all of their data in, and uh, I wish that wasn't such a new concept in a lot of places, but unfortunately, it still is. Um, eventually, you know, the worms that we had gave way to viruses. So back in I think, 1987, we had people like John McAfee, back before he was the illustrious figure he is today, when he was just a quiet, unassuming fellow compared to current times, uh, writing uh, things to remove malware infections from Amigas. So uh, back then, that was a bit of a mitigation control. You had like an executable or something, and then a virus went and put its hooks into it and middled around with it, and it was quite a complicated thing to undo it. Whereas uh, nowadays, what we call a virus is basically a Trojan. It's just like a file you have to delete. So effectively, all they are is detection mechanisms that have like a delete command built in. Not much to it. Uh, obviously, we've since moved on. We've got a bunch of other things. There's like probably 15 different things running on every single endpoint at this point inside your organization, doing a lot of detection and heuristics and machine learning and all sorts of cool stuff. Just ask the people out here. They'll sell you any and all of those things. Fill your boots. Problem is, computers are doing the detection, but humans are still doing the response. So every you know, widget, doodad, doohickey you go and buy it there, every blinking light box, it gives you more and more detection capability. You're lumping back on just regular old humans who are trying to make decisions and do something about it. And that's, uh, that's pretty challenging. And there's a lot of really bad outcomes I'm seeing in our industry, even just from people that I know. And uh, I guess that's what I, when I saw the topic for this conference was about resilience. There's obviously the technical resilience, but I think the personal resilience is a lot more important. We rely on personal resilience in order to protect our environments. So when you're looking at your employees, uh, like the, the image here in the background, that's a, a stress fracture. Uh, I'm sure many people here may have had a stress fracture. So what happens when you get a bit of an injury, you don't rest it, you keep aggravating it, eventually your arm explodes. You don't see it coming. Um, the way that we avoid these sorts of things is resting people. But Stress isn't just physical stress. It's not just lifting servers and stuff around. Um, reactive effort is stressful. Um, a lot of this stuff is measured in the medical field with doctors and nurses. When you've got people working a 16-hour shift where they're doing reactive effort, they don't know what's happening, they're running from one thing to the other to try and make decisions, that wears people down. 
Um, feeling undervalued or not listened to by your management is also incredibly stressful. Um, the thing that we don't hear a lot about uh, in, when we're talking about user education is that there's some very good uh, neuroscience research that says that the, the average person, give or take, can hold four concepts in their mind at any given point. So if you're looking at, say, this slide, there's maybe four things that you can bear in mind. So when we give our staff a bunch of training, we give them 187 easy tips for spotting a phishing email, they can only hold four in their head. If they're actually trying to do their job at the same time, we're really putting them under a lot of cognitive load. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can go about uh, reducing that. When you take all of these disparate like list items and you look, group them together and make concepts, like it seems a bit weird and don't click on it, that's a little bit easier to contain. But when it's like, look for this, look at the domain, look at where the first slash is, that's incredibly stressful for people and it's going to be very hard. Uh, in terms of the GDPR, um, I'm sure you've all heard about it in your mailboxes. I won't make any we've changed our privacy policy jokes during this talk, I promise. But uh, one thing about the GDPR that you don't hear a lot talked about, other than you know, people can't hold your data, which uh, I'll get to, is that there's a mandatory uh, disclosure to regulatory authorities in under 72 hours in the case of a breach. So if anyone here has ever done incident response on a breach, like after 72 hours, you're usually scratching the surface. This is going to be incredibly stressful on our staff if we're calling them in and saying, all right, so you've got you know, at best three days before we have to go to the European regulators and explain to them what we did, how we stuffed up, who's got it, and what we're going to do about it. Um, employee resilience is going to be a bigger and bigger problem as this is happening. Uh, it's already bad enough at the board level and whatever else. When you've got regulatory stuff, saying 72 hours, that is going to be incredibly difficult. I guess the other thing is that if you think about it in terms of athletes, if the army had people who were sitting at desks all day, every day for six months, then we went, come on, all right, everyone, get up out of your chairs, we're going to go run a half mile. Most of them are going to come back with shin splints. Because unless you're regularly using those muscles, unless you're regularly exercising those skills, stuff falls apart. So the ultimate, maybe not the ultimate, one of the most important things we can do to try and increase the resilience of our employees is to train them and drill them. Um, and that's effectively what we do with athletes. Um, you know, we train them, we make sure they're doing things correctly, we supervise them, you know, we watch it back, we monitor their performance and understand how they're going. Um, they practice, they probably practice every day if it's something that's you know, their main discipline, otherwise it's something they come back to periodically. Um, we give them the right equipment. You know, you wouldn't just give a pole vaulter a broom and tell them to go out there and do their thing. So why would you give a uh, incident responder like Notepad or Microsoft Word and tell them to use it to uh, coordinate a really complicated incident across four sites around the world? And we rest them. Um, when people have been doing stressful jobs, and especially if it's a key person risk, there's always that temptation just to get that person and throw them back in. And, or having a, a Sev1 outage. You've got an outage, it's like, I need you back in at Monday morning, 9am, so you can talk to us about you know, what the outcome of that might be. So people don't, don't uh, get a rest, they end up with stress, and eventually, quite often, ends up falling apart. And you know, like broken bones are bad enough, but when we're talking about emotional damage and burnout, that is like incredibly uh, bad for the staff. But also, if you're in just purely cold-blooded, it's expensive. If you've got someone who's out for six months, like if you're the worst pointy-haired boss out there, like you should care about that because having someone available for six months because they're emotionally burnt out, like yeah, your insurers won't like that. And when we're talking about training, I don't necessarily mean like send them on training like people have been doing here at Ozcert, like that's great. But just pick what it is that they're supposed to do when things go wrong and try it in a controlled, supervised format. So like it's, it doesn't have to be anything over the top or super organized. You know, maybe you just wait until your antivirus finds something and you go, all right, everyone, we're going to pretend that was a really big incident. We're going to run it down. We're going to find out how that happened. We're going to find out how it got in. Um, getting junior staff to do things like forensic captures when like, life's aren't on the line is a great idea rather than having them do it for the first time at you know three in the morning on the CEO's laptop like that that's not good for people and for that matter like failing things over our uh, business continuity planning tends to sort of be a bit of a sibling of security but we don't see so much of it in security so if your main tools were unavailable what would you do how would you do it um try it out like uh, understand what it would be like if you couldn't rely on your key mitigations if you couldn't get onto your management network um, what a lot of uh, banks will do still to this day, and a lot of people maybe don't know about, is that they'll just like run paper, and you know, one day every so often, if there's a good excuse or just because, they go, all right, everyone, pretend the computer systems are down. You know, we're back to the old school way of doing it from the 1980s, and do it with a pen and paper. 
And once you know how to do it, when you have to do it when things go horribly wrong, you can, and it's fine. It's not a massive stressful situation. It's just a little bit inconvenient. Uh, technical resilience. Uh, this is obviously something that, uh, yeah, there's lots of people out here that will try and sell you resilience. Quite often, what you're really getting is robustness. Robustness is putting thicker walls in. Um, resilience is ultimately about your ability to respond and put things back the way they were after something bad happens. And I think a lot of governments and a lot of large corporates coming around to the view that you can't stop bad things happening. I like, would love to, that'd be fantastic, but it doesn't matter how thick your walls are, eventually someone's going to get through. So you need to be able to go and, you know, restore. Um, Something that I find incredibly frustrating, and this is from a security testing point of view and also sort of post-incident response, if someone like broke into your house and stole your car keys and then stole your car, you'd change the keys to your house, right? It's the first thing most people do when they get broken into. But when's the last time you saw someone completely roll all of the keys in their Active Directory environment? When's the last time you saw someone make all of their staff change their passwords because someone managed to compromise the domain controller? Like, I've never seen it, personally. And, and even if you do it once, maybe that's not enough. Maybe they've still got a way in. Maybe someone set the same password back again. Um, maybe you've got people, and I almost guarantee many of you in this room will have staff accounts for people who left five years ago. Uh, quite often when people are marched, they maybe don't follow the HR process fully. And uh, you know, some of those people probably still have live accounts. Uh, I've been involved in incident response work where the initial culprit was suspected to be a disgruntled former administrator who got marched. Um, it's, it's a very difficult problem to deal with. And um, yeah, just think about changing the keys. That's a massive thing for resilience because if you turf someone out of your environment and then they just take the admin password and log right back in, you've effectively got no resilience there. Um, things like having strong password hashes and whatever. This isn't a technical talk, this is a keynote, but absolutely do that stuff. Um, Demilitarised zones. Uh, so, you know, photo here of like razor wire. You know, we used to have this funny old concept back in the old days of you know, when firewalls were king of having a DMZ, and a lot of people still have that in the diagrams of their networks now. The idea is that it was supposed to be you know, much like uh, North and South Korea. It's a big area. Nothing in it really matters. You can pave over it. You can burn it to the ground and build it up again. Um, you shouldn't have client data in your DMZ. You shouldn't have your main authentication stuff going into your DMZ. But once again, we still see it all the time. It, you need to look at how you design things, and no amount of widgets is going to give you resilience. For that matter, just some stupid stuff all in here. Like, why do you let people download executables? Like, who in your organization has to be able to download Bonzi Buddy installer.exe and run it? Like, it, maybe IT staff, maybe. But even then, you've got better ways of doing this. Um, why can web servers browse the web? Sorry, why can uh, just regular servers, why can domain controllers browse the web? Shouldn't just be doing it. Why can your administrators use web browsers? Mm, once again, shouldn't do it. Really convenient, uh, I almost guarantee. A lot of people go, yeah, of course, it's obvious, but no one eats their own dog food and turns that stuff, stuff off. Um, reducing uncertainty is a very good way of also uh, managing the resilience of your environment. If you have lots of really good logs, you know what happens, then you can be reasonably certain when you're mitigating something that you got it all. Because if you don't know what happened and you don't know whether you've done everything, then you don't have any resilience. Um, logically flat networks, uh, yes, once again, I'm in a privileged position to see a lot of people's network diagrams and all the beautiful segregation between the different zones and all of that, and then this big old server in the middle called domain controller that has a connection to everything, including usually uh, boxes on the periphery, dev servers, test servers, um, laptops everyone takes home and let the kids play Minecraft on them weekend. Um, most people run logically flat networks, even if they're physically segmented. Uh, it makes it incredibly difficult to do incident response. And uh, yeah, once again, no resilience. Um, Two-factor is absolutely critical. Uh, if anyone saw Alex Tilley's talk just before mine over that way somewhere, um, he had some great examples of that. Like, if you don't have two-factor on your Outlook web access, like any fool who manages to get a password can log on, can read your email, read your salespeople's email, payroll people's emails, redirect, rewrite. Um, you're basically giving them the keys to your kingdom as far as your business processes matter with nothing but access to an inbox and a you know, laptop sitting there in Ghana. It doesn't take much. Um, we, as an industry in security, are absolutely awful at this. Uh, I very, very rarely see anyone requiring two-factor for IT administrative functions, and usually for some sort of silly excuse like, oh, if there's an outage, maybe we can't log in. But there's solutions to that, like UBKs and stuff do a great job. Um, 
I really don't like the fact that so many of the really easy attacks that we have against our uh, modern networks, you know, it, it, they're basically almost line for line out of 1990s action movies like Die Hard here. Like, you know, most of the time, you know, you might have a really secure environment, but you've got these like big person-sized ventilation, ventilation ducts going between everything. It's incredibly easy to get through your environments. Um, precision. This is a bit of a crossover between the technical uh, resilience and the human resilience. So, you know, once again, back in the old days, it was indicators of compromise. Some people will still sell you these now, like an IP address. You know, who cares? IPs are cheap. How many thousand IPs do you want? I'll sell them to you. Um, hashes for malware, like it costs like a nano cent to recompile a piece of malware with a new hash or change a byte in it. Like a hash is an absolutely worthless but very precise means of detecting a piece of malware. So when we were back in the old days, if they ever really existed, when we could rely on things like that's an IP address and that's bad, that hash is bad, oh, this thing's good, it was easy. There's a great deal of precision. But now that we're going into all of these uh, sort of machine learning and heuristics and looking at stuff like, uh, like the living off the land binary, so things that you can use to run on your system and then that lets you run another thing as if it was signed, all of this, we're lowering precision. And when we're lowering precision, you can't go, you know, you can no longer go whitelist, blacklist. You've got this giant gray list in the middle. And quite often we're relying on humans to actually deal with them and to assess them with usually very small amounts of information and uh, probably about 15 different screens that they have to log into. I've got to log into the scene, I've got to log into this thing, I've got to look at the file, I've got to look at this. You need to join it all together, give people one thing to look at so they can make a decision. Because, yeah, like we're just stressing people out. And for that matter, like alarms, I hate alarms. Alarm fatigue is a massive thing in the medical industry. You know, people have their pager. You know, you know it's like nurses have their pages in a, in a hospital and they're constantly going off, constantly clicking go. You know, maybe not reading them fully because they've already gone off 15 times that minute while they're trying to talk to someone. Uh, we push this on security people as well. Like the, uh, the target breach in the US was a classic example where their outsourced vendor, who quite possibly they didn't entirely trust when they were raising alerts, said, hey, we got this malware detected in all of our boxes. Someone back at head office went, Ugh, and clicked the button, go away. You know, all these alarms are always trashed, don't read them properly. If you've got that high false, po false positive rate for things you put in front of people, they're going to ignore them. Um, so you need to be able to sort things, give the context so they know what to actually do about it. Um, and on that note, just uh, I, I'm always trying to find, because people go, oh, antivirus, do we need antivirus? Should we not have antivirus? I, I've got another sort of metaphor for it. If you're familiar with like food production plants, antivirus is like the metal detector that they got on the uh, conveyor belt going out of the hot dog machine. So like it's going to look for foreign objects in a hot dog, like a you know a bit of a nail or something. but. That isn't the end of the control process. You shouldn't be relying on your fail-safe to protect you if there's like foreign matter in your food or if there's foreign matter in your environment. It's like a last best chance you've got to catching things. The way that you actually go and set up your environment should be robust and resilient and you shouldn't have to fall back on detecting something that's already on your machine. If it's running on your machine, you're already screwed, to be honest. Uh, in terms of the alarm fatigue, the one thing I would suggest is instead of going ping, check out this, ping, check out this, like batch them together by like groups, give someone a daily task or a weekly task to go through a list of the same type of thing and then sort them and then go, okay, so what rules can we make about this? Rather than looking at them as isolated little things because yeah, once again, it's, it's a lot more of a, it's a proactive step instead of a reactive step if it's something you don't have to do on the spot. Uh, yeah, death by a thousand cuts or in this case includes. So usually to most of you, I said, oh, you know, what, how many servers does your company have? You might go, oh, I don't know, 100 or something. But you're thinking about your servers. When you look at what your business relies on, there's, it's a graph. You've got all of your things, all of your service providers things, all of your service provider service providers things, all of your tracking cookie providers, all of your analytics people, you've got Google in there, God knows where, you've got DNS providers, you've got just a bit of everything all over the place. Um, particularly ad includes, ad networks will be, sold, will be selling traffic three or four times over with all sorts of people tracking stuff. Um, and yeah, once again, like not to throw rocks because they're not the worst at this, maybe a little bit to throw rocks, but I called the ATO about this last year or year before. Um, if you go to the thing to find out about your current tax debt, there's uh, two Google ad 
uh, two uh, Google tracking cookies in there so other people can buy ATO traffic. Uh, if anyone here wants to start a payday loan company, maybe you want to go to some ad networks and say, hey, I only want to buy traffic from people who have been to the ATO's Oh No, I Owe a Lot of Money page. It's probably a really good money spinner, great way to spend your advertising bucks. Or um, you know, if you really want to get a really detailed view of it, go to Qualtrics, because they, uh, they measure performance on websites, they help you understand how people use your website. Um, they have a JavaScript injected into the ATO website that lets them take screenshots of it for you know, customer purpose for uh, customer reassurance and understand what's going on and testing, uh, maybe A and B testing. I don't exactly know what they use it for. All I know is that the uh, site intercept got qualtrics.com uh, injects a screenshotting JavaScript function. Um, I've called them about it. They acknowledge that, yeah, it wasn't great. Um, and by no means the only, uh, the only culprit on this. Uh, most government websites at the very least include Google. Um, it's unfortunate I'm not replacing Alice to Heaven Given, otherwise uh, that would maybe be my first thing on the thing. And um, private industry is even worse. Um, it is absolutely endemic in Australia that uh, you will have probably three to four different ad providers. Uh, you'll have Adobe and God knows who else up in every transaction you do on a website, running arbitrary JavaScript in the scope of the page you're viewing. Um, there are dozens of services out there that will record user sessions. Uh, you will notice many of them running on government websites, uh, not necessarily banking websites because they're a little bit more aware of this, but maybe on the periphery of the banking industry, definitely. Um, yeah, but yeah, you, your environment is only as secure as the least secure thing that you inject into your transactional web pages if you deal with your customers through the web. If you've just got a marketing site, then yeah, cool, it's only reputational loss, like, uh, I don't know, uh, say SBS, serving malware to everyone who's interested in the Tour de France. Um, not a whole lot of media reporting about it, but it happened. It happens all the time. Um, all of the major newspapers will serve malware for, you know, oh, if I had to guess, I'd probably say about a day in total every year. It's usually, you know, two or three hours of a morning and it might happen every quarter. Um, incredibly common because they don't know who their advertisers are. They don't know who their advertising networks are. For that matter, those people don't even know who they're buying the ads from to display them on the sites. Um, you can buy... If any of you have a big brand, I encourage you to go to advertising networks and ask whether you can buy traffic on your website. Chances are, even if you manage your own advertising, someone will fraudulently sell you ads for your website that never actually appear. It's absolutely awful industry. So in terms of what to do about it, you know, I've complained a lot about resilience, but you know, I think the answer is big red buttons. You go into any sort of manufacturing site or, you know, like a machine shop or whatever, you'll see, or, yeah, for that matter, SCADA. You know, no matter how many cool computers you've got protecting you from bad things happening, big red buttons. Everyone knows what a big red button looks like. Everyone should know where to find the big red button. Everyone knows how to mash it with their hand when things go wrong. And you don't have to know the 17 steps for shutting down the pumping station because you've got a big red button. Um, we should have more of these in computing. Um, you should learn from your incident response. When someone has to go off script, when they're doing an incident response activity and they have to find out how to do something or log in and do something manually, as part of your post-incident review, you should be going, all right, so how can we instrument a process and more importantly, automation that stops someone from having to do this manually again? Um, if you don't do post-incident reviews, both for your own and then high profile stuff, um, I don't really know what to tell you. Um, particularly, uh, we talk to a lot of people who want to do uh, Threat intelligence, basically. But what threat intelligence effectively boils down to is learning from other people's mistakes. If you haven't learned from your own mistakes first, then yeah, that's probably the first place to look, right, before you go and start buying stuff about you know, what China's doing or whatever. You know, look at your own incidents, look at what you can do to prevent them from happening. Um, some examples of big red buttons that you might want to be able to press are blocking traffic to or from a domain, an IP, or a net block. Uh, if you have an outsourced... Um, networking provider, which you probably do. If you're under a denial of service attack, do your people who are on call, you know, if you, for example, wanted to block, let's say China, lots of bandwidth in China, lots of poorly managed machines. If, you, if someone went, oh crap, we're in real trouble, I think we should block China, would they know the business practice? Would they know who to call internally? Um, would, even for that matter, would your IT managers know whether they're authorized to sign off on that? Uh, would you know how to contact the right people at your network provider to do it? All of this stuff. You want to know how to do it, you want to try it out, I mean, maybe not blocking a whole country, but you want to know whether these practices work so when someone gets woken up at 3 a.m. when they're on call, they can do something about it. 
Um, isolating a desktop system, um, once again, as I said, like malware has moved on back from the old days. Um, you can't just shut down a machine and image the disk anymore. Um, anyone who is even remotely smart uh, will not be touching the disk and will be using uh, built-in uh, Windows capabilities or Linux capabilities or me just purely memory resident malware because it's really not that hard. It doesn't cost you anything. And it means if the machine's shut down and brought up again, there's nothing to see. So you need to be able to isolate machines on your network so you can capture memory. Um, even if you don't have the internal expertise to do anything with memory, you want to be able to capture it so that someone else can go and look at it. Um, once again, as I mentioned before, like rolling Active Directory keys, know how to force a password change of all of your admins, do it at random like a fire drill so everyone knows how to do it and can do it. Um, change the passwords on your system accounts because no one ever does that. That'd be a great idea. Um, and the, <laughs> I've been uh, greatly overjoyed seeing the uh, GDPR stuff where because of the uncertain GDPR status of a number of advertising networks, some US newspapers had to remove all of their ads and their tracking hence making the page loads half a second faster. So you know, if you've got pages that aren't really bringing in ad revenue, just remove the ads. Like, tell people I said it's fine, but you know. Um, personal data. Uh, many people will have heard that uh, you know, data is the new oil. You know, it was a big sort of push. Anyone that sort of, you know, their CEO caught the whole thing about uh, you know, we need data miners, and you probably do need data miners, but um, yeah. It was the new oil, but I think we can all hopefully agree that nowadays it's a new uranium. Uh, you wouldn't load a filing cabinet full of uranium and sell it at a surplus tender auction in Canberra. Um, you shouldn't just leave it lying around your offices. You should know where all of your uranium is and store as little uranium as possible. Like substitute personal data in there, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, in, in boxing, they say that you know, the best way not to get knocked out is not to get hit. If you don't hold personal information, no one can steal it. You can't lose it. Um, the number of questions that people ask you on your website, like, why do you need to know my mother's maiden name as a recovery question? Firstly, it's on Facebook. Secondly, it's PII that you don't need to hold. This is one more thing that you can get screwed over on. Um, I know we're cybersecurity now, but we used to be information security or infosec. And like, you can't, like, it's like Pandora's box. You can't take information back off someone. Like once it's gone, it's gone. You just have to deal with the consequences. Or more likely, your end users have to deal with the consequences and you make a pithy press release about it. But um, if someone steals your compute to mine Monero or Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever, then that's no good. You lose a bit of money. You know, maybe you talk to Amazon nicely and they might give it back to you depending on how you lost it. But when you lose people's trust and in information, you can't just go and put it back. You can't ensure information as much as people try. When you do get breached, please, please don't send me an email to say that you're giving me credit uh, monitoring and then like breach reporting, because like I know I got breached. You're the idiots that lost my data. You gave my data to other idiots who previously lost my data in the US in order to monitor it. Like just distributing my information further when you get breached is not an answer to the thing. Maybe just like send me 50 bucks in the mail. That's probably a better approach if you want people to be happy with it, and it probably costs about the same. Um, foreign handling, while I'm throwing rocks, foreign handling and storage of Australian PII is absolutely woeful. Um, once the data leaves Australia, once it's located in another usually developing country where you can pay cents on the dollar to get it processed, um, Australian data protection laws no longer apply, it's no longer within the realms of control, and you can't tell us that your third party lost the data because you can't pass off risk. I mean, you can try, but no one's really going to buy it. If you're the Australian company who's holding my data, you're the one who lost it. You're the one who's responsible. Um, there's a lot of paranoia, I think, about the Australian government and the way the government holds data and what the government holds. Um, as someone who's worked in government, admittedly not in the area that holds all your personal information and elsewhere, I can tell you that like, the amount of data that any random Australian utility company, phone company, or whatever else, especially advertising companies, holds on you absolutely dwarfs anything that the government might be able to put together. Even any intelligence agency in their wildest dreams won't have what you know, Google's uh, double-click ad network has. They know so much about you, and yet we hold them to such a low degree of scrutiny compared to the way that we always tut the government of having a bad SSL site. Like, go to a credit reporting agency. If you've never spoken, if you're not a customer of Vada or uh, Experian or Dun & Bradstreet, like, you've got no relationship with them, um, it's guaranteed under law you can go and ask them, go, what do you guys have on me? And you'll find every time that you uh, spoke to a sales clerk at JB Hi-Fi about getting a, uh, a television on, you know, 
the 50 month interest free plan. There'll be a record of the TV you wanted to buy held with those credit reporting agencies because they wanted to see whether you're good for it. Um, every loan you applied for, every loan you've got, every large financial transaction you've made, uh, the value of your property, where you live, all of that is held by these agencies which are maintained under industry codes. But like, you know, we're all scared about the government and the ATO passing data to other agencies, but private industry has so much personal data on us that it's effectively unregulated in terms of the way it's held, and they've got no idea where it is. You can buy a $200 hard disk down at you know, Officeworks or JB Hi-Fi that will hold all of the tax data from every Australian on it, pretty much, if you compressed it the right way. It's so easy to lose data, and it's all over the place. Uh, anyone who does, uh, does uh, bug bounty programs will tell you that test environments are more often than not just slightly old mirrors of live production data but with worse passwords. Um, your personal information is everywhere and you should be worried. I've got a bit of an idea. Once again, I try not to just be a problems guy, although perhaps it is my nature. Um, surety bonds. So if you're an Australian company, or for that matter, a foreign company, um, and you want to do something that we're pretty sketchy about. Uh, you want to go and have an open cut mine. Um, you want to go and do some sort of giant development on the banks of a river. We're concerned you're going to pollute it. We can't put it back the way it is. Uh, we have this concept, particularly in the mining industry, but also in corruption, called in construction, called a surety bond. So we say, you know what? We'll let you do it, but we'll only give you the permit if you put, say, $100 million in trust. And then in the future, once you go and you put everything back the way you said you would, according to your agreement with us, we'll give you back your $100 million. Um, what if the company that you work for, because you all hold personal information on someone, what if you had to put $25 in trust for every person whose private information you held? What, do you think that would change maybe the way that you handled things? Do you think you have a little bit of a better idea on where all your backup tapes are at any given point? Uh, maybe dev servers would have a little bit less real data on them. Um, yeah, just an extra $5 for every copy. How much of a difference would that can make in terms of the way you handle information? And $25 is nothing for someone's you know, livelihood, their personal information, everything about them. Ultimately, all this stuff sort of comes down to ethics a bit. Um, I know I've sort of talked perhaps about the legal side of it, but... Can you imagine if you work in, a, in private industry here, and once again, government's perhaps different, but meeting a person at a barbecue, and they go, oh, where do you work? Because oh, I work for XYZ, and it's like, oh, I'm a customer there. Oh, cool. Can you imagine explaining to that person how, how you hold their personal information and how you use it, and maybe other places that your organization passes that information onto? Uh, maybe the advertising networks that you know their information goes into and it's used to track them and link them and go to their Facebook and understand their political leanings. Like, would that feel a bit icky if you actually told people how much your organisation cares about their personal information and holding it? Or um, perhaps if you lost a bunch of their health information and you uh, outed them to their family or whatever as having, uh, you know, maybe they're reevaluating their sexuality and you've outed someone. Um, there's a reason I use that as an example, is because the uh, family planning New South Wales had uh, 2.5 years, which is approximately 8,000 people, they think, worth of uh, inquiries on their web form that got hacked. So they, they ran a Drupal site, and uh, you know, I'm going to play a little bit of uh, armchair incident responder here, but you know, they've got a lot of Drupal admins. It looks like it certainly was a Drupal site. So they ran a Drupal site. You could inquire um, if you wanted to talk to a family planning person about you know, like a STI, an unwanted pregnancy, or whatever. Um, they unfortunately stored that on their server um, on Australia Day, being the, sorry, on Anzac Day, 25th of April. Uh, they were compromised by someone who was uh, demanding Bitcoin in order to restore the data. Uh, it sounds like the Bitcoin. Uh, Ransom people were probably not super competent and maybe didn't exactly manage to get all of the data that was there. They might have looked in the wrong spot for it. But uh, so the Drupal Geddon 2 exploit, where if you read about it, it was a bit of a clangor. I generally recommend against using Drupal. That was uh, released on the 29th of March. So that's, what, about a month before. Um, most people wouldn't patch in a month, but you know, let's be kind. And let's assume that the people at Family Plan New South Wales did patch, and entirely, entirely possible that they did. So on the 25th, the day they got hacked, the Drupal Geddon 3 exploit came out, which people found because of a flaw in the original patch for Drupal Geddon 2, funnily enough. So it's entirely possible and entirely likely that they got hacked, their 
internet-facing web server got hacked on the day that the exploit came out. It was an Australian public holiday. No one had any chance to do anything about it because, you know, hopefully they're having a you know, barbecue with friends or whatever. So in that circumstance, and knowing that could happen, as far as I'm concerned, the only ethical and moral thing you can really do is just not hold the information there. Or better yet, don't hold the information. If you've got people who are making inquiries that are at a sensitive nature, just don't store them. Or, you know, make sure people delete the email or whatever. Don't have them sitting around. That's ultimately the problem that we're facing here, is that everyone's got this idea of being a bit of a pack rat. Everyone wants to keep the information, because maybe I need it later. Maybe it'll be really handy. Uh, we might want to do out a Linux audit in future, so let's just keep everything anyone ever does on our website. Um, you know, maybe eventually you merge with another company and they've got another really cool data set and you can smush it with yours. And that's a great, really cool thing to look at as a technical person, but as an ethical person and as, you know, a member of the human race, I'm not necessarily promoting sort of collectivist kumbaya sort of philosophy here, but just you as a person are responsible for the information that your organisation holds, whether or not you're directly in charge of it. And I'm seeing a worrying trend in Australia, and I guess it is partly due to regulatory pushes, of people who have the title of, uh, you know, CSO or CISO, but they don't report to boards, they don't necessarily even report to a CEO. Quite often they report to a CIO. So as much as they're a chief, and they're going to certainly appear as a chief in the media, they're going to be the one who gets pilloried over a data breach. They're not necessarily taking a job where they actually have the authority to do something about it. If you're not reporting to a board and you're a CISO, I would have you strongly consider the way that your name is going to appear in the media when invariably something bad happens. Because let's face it, it's resilience. Something bad happens to everyone, and you can only control what the impact of that is as it relates to you, as it relates to your company, as it relates to the public. But yeah, think ethically. Like, if you have no ethical uh, or moral qualms with the way that your organization holds stuff, then cool, you've done really well, or you just haven't really thought about it or looked into it that much. But you know, otherwise, yeah, I, I encourage everyone to have a bit of a think about what it would feel like explaining the way that you hold data to, you know, to a person who was affected by it. Anyway, I'm a little bit early, but uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, any questions, or I'll also take comments with don't you think at the end. That, that's close enough to a question. I will take feelings, emotions. That's an emotion and a thought. I like it. Thank you. I think I scared you all off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Once again, thank you to Kane.